Hi, this is Erika Kassab from Small Robot Studio. In this video, I will show you a beginner and intermediate workflow for painting portraits. If you already have experience, stick around to review fundamentals. By the way, the painting demo is in Clip Studio Paint, with the December 2020 update that now records time elapses and can import Photoshop brushes. Before painting, we need to choose the right reference. Ideally, go for images with a clear difference of light and shadow and a nice variety of values. Beauty shots are not ideal. Let me show you how by picking tones from these two images. The values of the beauty shots are very similar between each other, unlike photography with clear light and shadow. Beauty shots avoid extreme light and shadow to have a softer looking skin, but for painting, flat lighting is a faux pas. Other types of not ideal photos are underexposed, overexposed, taken with flash, blurred, or overall low resolution. It's not like it's impossible to use this sort of photos, but they are way harder to work with. I'm gonna open my chosen photo in Clip Studio and change it into grayscale if needed. I'll make a black layer on top and set it to color blending mode. I'll make two duplicates of the original photo and apply a blur at different levels. You'll find this on the top menu, filter, blur, Gaussian blur. I will say both as an extra version of my reference. Why do I do this? Well, one of the biggest mistakes I made as a beginner was getting too carried away with details, which resulted in a poor structure and floppy shading. The blurry references force me to focus on the main shapes. Our first goal is to paint a light and shadow map, the whole portrait only in two values. So let's start with the base sketch. This is not a drawing tutorial, so I won't go into the anatomy of the features. Still, don't let this intimidate you. Focus on shapes instead. If it helps you before drawing, trace on top of the blur reference. Look for abstract shapes, only divide into sections, light and shadow. This kind of abstract shapes are way easier to draw than eyes or noses. So here's my sketch with both anatomy and shapes. I'll create a ledger on top to sample three different values of grey. One for the background, one which will be the average of light, and another average of shadow. I'll fill with color the background layer. On a new layer, I will paint the full silhouette of the portrait with the average shadow. I'll pay attention to the different kind of edges around the silhouette. Some borders are softer or defined, depending if it's describing hair, skin, or fabric. With a fully filled silhouette, I mean no transparency or holes, I'll select it by clicking the layer thumbnail while pressing Ctrl or Command for Mac. Create a folder and make a mask out of that selection. Any layer inside this folder will respect the original silhouette. In other words, even when I paint outside of it, the paint won't go outside. So every layer of my painting will go inside. I'll make a new layer for the family of light and paint it. In my sketch, all the shapes have defined edges, but in my reference I see all sorts of transitions. They range from defined, soft and completely lost. Depending on how round is the shape we are describing, the transition will look sharper or softer. I find perfect gradients too boring, so you'll see me play around with textural brushes and opacity changes. This first stage is a bit boring looking. Nevertheless, it makes 70% of my painting. Even though it looks simple, I find it fairly difficult. So don't let frustration win if it takes you a while. When you are able to turn off the sketch layer and the painting grids, you are ready to move on. On each next stage, we will paint the different parts of light and shadow on separate layers. I'll quickly explain them as I paint them. If you want a more detailed explanation, check out my Light and Shadow 101 video. And since I am in commercial time, let me take a moment to thank our dear patrons. Your support is key for bringing new videos every week. You can join us and access monthly rewards at patreon.com slash smallrobotstudio. Alright, let's carry on. How about we start with the family of light? For each element of this family, I'll make a new layer on top of the original family of light layer and set these new layers to clipping mask. Same purpose as before with the folder mask. 
We will continue painting the brightest side, which are the surfaces pointing toward the light source. These are called center of light. I'll pick a new value, just a bit lighter than my average light, and paint. These are usually super subtle transitions. You won't find many sharp edges. As we move away from the center of light, closer to the shadow areas, we enter the mid-tone. Some mid-tones will look darker than others, so there isn't only one mid-tone. We will pick the darkest one. Note that we are still working inside the family of light, so don't choose the mid-tone exactly between your original average color, but closer to the average of light. For the less dark mid-tones, I will still use this value I picked, but I will lower the opacity of my brush. Let's move on to the shadow family, which is divided in three sections. First, a slightly lighter area created by the reflected light from other objects around it. In this case, some parts of the skin reflect into others, like the lit up area of the clavicle and t-shirt reflecting underneath the jaw, or the lit up cheek reflecting into the eyelid and the side of the nose. To paint this, I am creating a new layer on top of the shadow family, but underneath the family of light. Now, pick your average shadow and go a tiny bit lighter, without crossing towards the family of light. The next shadow are from the areas that did not receive this reflected light. They are known as core shadows. By painting the reflected light, we already did most of the core shadow areas as well. Now we are missing the extremes of the value range. Let's focus on the darkest darks, known as occlusion shadows. The word occlusion means blocked, so in this context, legs exposed or blocked from the light. Surfaces really close together block the light to each other. The darkest tones occur when there is contact between two surfaces. The usual areas of occlusion shadows are the nostrils, the wings of the nose, the folds of the eyelids and underneath them, between the lips, and if visible, the inside areas of the ears. I'll use this layer to darken slightly some coarse shadows and paint my occlusion shadow. Depending on its color, facial hair can also give us areas of darker value. For them, I'll do yet another layer. Do not paint a solid darker block or define every single hair shape. That looks weird. Instead, design your shapes and the borders to blend with the skin and use just a few individual hairs. Let's do now the other extreme, the brightest values. These are really tiny bright shapes, a reflection of the light source, known as a specular reflection. Think of this as the cherry on top. Don't exaggerate adding lots. Let's focus just on the eyes. In the past, my students have painted the sclera, meaning the white area of the eyes, with a flat, really light value. The sclera is part of a sphere, with areas more exposed to light than others, so you will see changes of tone. As mentioned before, the eyelid coming to contact with the sclera means there will be an occlusion shadow. Plus, there's usually a projected shadow in the sclera from the eyelids. Not to mention eyelashes that can darken the value even more. The thing is, painting all of these shapes individually, especially the eyelashes, can lead to creepy looking results. Merge all this into a few shapes. The very same thing applies to hair. Do not define every single strand, think in groups and simplify. When in doubt, look back at the blur references. If something is not distinguishable, then simplify it. The final stages will be color correcting. On top of everything, create a level adjustment layer. On the top menu, click on layer, new correction layer, level correction. With a few movements of these arrows, I will push the contrast of my values. If you want to make new changes later, just double click on the same layer and adjustment again. If you end up not liking it, simply get rid of the layer. Once I have something that looks cool, I can make another extra layer on top and mess around with even more textural transitions. This is not necessary. It's just the type of a style I have fun experimenting with and I have been asked a couple times how to achieve this look. So have fun experimenting. Here we go, the final result. That's it for this tutorial. If you find it useful, make sure that you leave a like so other people can find it. 
And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe as we are bringing out CG and illustration tutorials every week. Become a patron and access tutorial assets, bonus content, a private discord and more by clicking in the link below.